Uh, so just to start, I'd like to thank you for coming on today, Nathan. And yeah, thank you for taking the time to come on the podcast and discuss your experience with the consultancy Catapult. Thanks, Raymond. Thanks for having me. Um, if you could just tell me the story behind founding Catapult and maybe discuss what led you to the point of founding it. Okay. Um, well, look, uh, I've been an industrial designer for well over 30 years, so sort of showing my age a little bit and sort of came through uh, originally from a um, working in a lighting consultancy. Then I worked at uh, outer space design uh, for about seven years. I was originally their first full-time employee back in the day, um, which was an exciting time to be involved in such an amazing consultancy and, and um, you know, one that's left a pretty big legacy on uh, Australian design culture. And then after about seven years, I moved to design and industry and, and um, took up a role with them in their Brisbane studio um, at the time. And uh, then... Uh, after a couple of years living and working in Brisbane, decided to move back to Victoria, which I'm, is where I'm from originally. And um, Murray Hunter gave me the opportunity to open uh, an office for DNI in Melbourne. So uh, I started that in my um, my mum's spare bedroom, actually, because we were living with my parents there for a bit while we were building a house, and uh, that grew to oh, over about seven or eight years. It sort of grew to about thirteen. 14 people by the time I left and at the at the end of that period I took a um, sabbatical with my family and went around Australia for 12 months with three young kids and my wife in towing a caravan and um, you know it was a time to reflect on where I was going with my life and what what I was interested in and and how um, what the next period would look like and we went all the way around Australia and got to Byron Bay and um, sort of one thing led to another and ended up staying here and um, ringing the removalists and getting our furniture delivered and um, got the kids in school and, and I looked around at my wife and said, what are we going to do? And decided that we'd start our own consultancy. And um, again, it started in a, in a very sort of low key way. And, and now um, 14 years later is, is, 24 people, three studios and, um, you know, a, a great sort of list of uh, clients and projects. So mm. it's been an exciting journey. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. What are the um, challenges of starting a in Byron Bay? Because I, when I saw you were located in Byron Bay, I thought it was really interesting as like there aren't many established design consultancies outside of the major cities in Australia. Yes. Um, so um, I guess based on that story, the original logic was a lifestyle change okay yeah. um and this is back in in 2008 2009 so um way before any of this was fashionable and it was actually really a little bit difficult to begin with but because it was just me initially and then a couple of of uh initial employees and contractors and sort of um a little bit seat of the pants originally it was mm -hmm. pretty easy to run it on the smell of an oily rag um as time has gone on, um, it's it's got easier and easier. Um, to be frank, it's not easy. It's not hard to get clients to come and visit us in Byron Bay. Mm -hmm. So um, you know that has a bit of resonance. And then, because my network was in Melbourne and Sydney to a lesser extent, um, the business built there. And as we grew and we we um, identified staff, we we just naturally became this distributed company. Mm, yep. Um, and so we quickly built up a small team in Melbourne and then um, uh, one of our Melbourne team wanted to move to Byron, one wanted to move to Sydney, all for family reasons. And so we facilitated that. So all of a sudden we had a Melbourne, Sydney and Melbourne presence, uh, sorry, Melbourne, Sydney, Byron presence. Mm. And um, that just went from there. And then I guess <laughs> if you think about it now, it doesn't seem at all out of place and and because of COVID and the way that the work environment has changed over the last three years, uh, it's quite a normal practice. But at the time, it was very foreign. Um, we've always made it a point to not let our geography um, 
interfere with the way that we do our work. So we'll still go, we're, we're traveling all the time to meet clients where we're doing things um, above and beyond in terms of communications and collaboration to get past the the perceived problem of distance. Mm. Um, but uh, I guess the other thing is that we probably get about 25% of our work typically from overseas. And so, you know, those clients, we routinely communicate with uh, remotely as, as we do with our suppliers in Asia and elsewhere. So um, the, the one thing that's happened, Roman, is that in the last five years, the tools and the technology have got much better. Um, <laughs> it used to be Skype and, you know, you'd be you'd be texting and the phone calls would drop out because uh, Byron Bay's uh, networks were typically pretty bad. Um, but but everything has improved. So yeah, Byron Bay's come so far. Like I remember I went there when I was a kid and it was like this yeah. little hippie town. And then now look at it, it's this like very upmarket like fashion brands and you know fancy restaurants. Yeah. It's come a long way. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly changed. Um, some would argue not for the better, but uh, yeah. look, it's it's a great place to live. Um, Ironically, now the business's headquarters is in Fitzroy in Victoria, and you know we have our largest team there, our biggest studio there. Um, we've got um, an equivalent team to our Byron team in in Sydney, so we, we are quite um, uh, ge geographically diversified, and it, it it really doesn't matter. We're we're, we're just trying to put forward um, a brand image and a and a service to all of our clients and whether whether they're serviced from here or Sydney or Byron, uh, Melbourne, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, no, I think definitely with the way the world's gone, it's definitely more possible now. Like it's it's, it's yeah. interesting, the prospect of maybe potentially having more studios in smaller locations in the future. Yeah. I, I think it's a very real thing. And I mean, we, uh, because of the way we work, we're very keen on collaboration. So we're collaborating with uh, other design studios in, in various parts of the world. We're collaborating with suppliers all over the world. We have clients all over the world. It It is a horses for courses type of thing. We've, we've got contractors who live in Canberra, for example, and um, you know we'll bring them in on certain projects in Newcastle and, and, and they work on particular projects and then they go and do other work when we're not using them. So I think that's pretty commonplace now and it's, it's actually a lot easier than than what people think mm, that's good uh what what are some of the biggest challenges you're facing as catapult um as a design consultancy and how do you overcome them okay um look i guess at a high level the biggest challenge we face in the australian market is convincing clients that that design is is a necessary thing and mm. um I mean, that's, that might sound a little bit um, old-fashioned, but I still see uh, in meetings from time to time that clients are, are not convinced. And one of the, the things that, that I like to say is that the design is an investment in success, mm. not a cost of doing business. And for, for us as a company, we really go to a lot of effort to sort of explain the ROI of design and, and why you're doing it. You're not just doing it to make a product look beautiful. Mm. You're doing it to make the user experience better and to, to make a product succeed and, and hit a target. Um, and that's very much our focus. Y yes, we want things to look great. That's that's a given. Like that's, mm. it's it's not the first thing that we think about. It's it's how is this product going to be used? Mm. What How can we make it more sustainable? How can we um, uh, manufacture it in a way that's innovative? What can we deliver to the client that, that provides a, a lower cost, a more reliable product? You know, mm -hmm. all of those aspects are much more of a driver. And the form or the form or the aesthetic is just this thing that comes through because that's in our DNA. Mm -hmm. And and so when we say design, we're, we're really talking about user experience and or customer experience in a lot of ways. And yeah. Um, so getting that message across and saying to a, to a client, it's worth investing the money. It's essential for you to invest the money in your product or your brand or whatever it may be to, to outperform your competitors and position yourself as a market leader. When we get that, um, 
that coalescence with our clients, the the magic happens, right? Mm. But if you if you're fighting them or you're you're dragging them along and they don't believe it or they're begrudgingly spending money on design, it's not always going to work. Yeah. Um, so that's probably the single biggest thing. And then then I think probably the the other thing is is really the fact that the Australian market is a small market, and mm. so you've got to build a presence, you've got to build um, a trust with your your clients mm. and you've you've got to keep generating work and 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 so that that whole idea of filling the the funnel of new projects is a is a really port, important activity and one that's um it, it can be challenging depending on the economic climate so they're, they're probably the two biggest things yeah. i i actually think um from our perspective um our business has matured a lot in the last five years and it's it's doubled in size and the the clients and the and the projects have got a lot more um a, a lot higher level in terms of the, the the type of activities we're doing and the deliverables and so on so um i i think um in in terms of doing the work and and having um access to great designers and a great team i think we're structured really well right now and yeah. and our team, you know, I couldn't be happier with our team. They're a great bunch of people. Mm. So that side of it's pretty good. It's probably more about the industry and 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 publicising the value of design and and mm. and getting it across at government levels. Um, I heard you talk to Neil Davidson, and he was talking about um, those types of issues and getting getting buy-in at government level. I mean, you'd be the same, but you know you're filling out government documents and things and you never have an option to put in that you're a designer as part of your career path you know it's yeah. always other yeah. <laughs> and that to me just represents the fact that people don't think about design they don't mm. by and large out in the world mm. even though everything they inter interact with is designed in some way mm. people don't know they don't give much thought to how that was created or why it was created so it's, i think it's an education process yeah it's really interesting what you're saying because I feel like definitely overseas, there's way more of an, of an emphasis on design and yes. like um they respect design more because maybe it's because there's more of a mature market over there opposed to here. Um, yes. But design hasn't, like it, it, there's still been these people working hard for the last like 30 years trying to get design up to that level, but it's still like, we're still kind of holding back a bit from moving on to the next level. Like Europe I, and America has. I, I would agree with that 100%. And I think, um, Part of that comes from Australia's culture as a, a bunch of inventors who mm. who've had to that we've been isolated as a country. We're a small small population, and we've had to make do. And and the the image in the the sort of broader public is that designers are like these crazy inventors, which is actually far from the truth. Yeah. And whereas in in Europe in particular, and in the US, there's a more mature approach to design, and and there's a better understanding of how that affects a company's bottom line mm. and 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 look going back to what neil was talking about about engaging with the c-suite mm. that's where we've got to hit and and i spend a lot of my time doing exactly the same thing and so there's some about bd guys is is trying to talk to the people who are making the decisions and influence them and, and show them mm. that design will make a difference to their profitability and yeah. the way that the brand is recognized and if we can do that then it, it it just it almost gets mandated mm. and then it makes it easy, you know, because we there's no doubt Australian designers do great work. It's mm. not that's not a question. It's more about getting a getting a flow through from the powers that be. I think as well, like there's currently like a big emphasis on UX design in the world. Like it's kind of mm. readily known that it's a it, it's easy to understand the metrics of UX and like actually track the success. Whereas I feel mm. like with industrial design it's a lot harder and like it's hard to show your value as an industrial designer um, because a lot of the time products don't succeed, but it's not necessarily because of the designer. It's just because of the yeah. market. Whereas like yeah, UX, you can always be like, there's a 20% improvement of like click through rate or something. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true too. And I, and I think there's a confusion around that. Look, it works both ways because mm. we find we're doing a lot of digital design mm. and, and, you know, working in that field because, a lot of the products we design have either got digital user interfaces built into them or they're connected to some sort of app or website. So you, you're you continuously thinking about the digital environment. Um, and 
I, I, obviously I'm biased, but I feel like industrial designers are really well placed mm. to design some of that and think about the logic. We're really good at asking questions and going out to the users and 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 seeing through their answers and getting to the um, the underlying challenges that they're facing. And yep. that whether the product's digital or physical, it, it doesn't make any difference. And often they need to coalesce, you know, they need to be working together. Yeah. So for us, that's a really important thing. Um, but I do agree with you that it's a lot easier to to see the metrics of a digital product versus a mm. physical product. It's very hard to prove that sometimes. Yeah, it's really it's also moved that way in Europe where like there's um designers who have got moved up to more of like a political level almost like you know giving more yes. political insight whereas in australia like it's very much like lawyers and business people that's their role in in um, governance but maybe in the future it'll move more into that who knows yeah i'd, I'd love to see designers as ceos I, yeah. I, I think um you know obviously the um the most publicized sort of company in the world apple yeah that they've ne- that they've now got a logistics guy as a ceo or the person in charge mm. um previously they had a businessman who was very design aligned and he, he he really heroed design and and in steve jobs and i think you're seeing a change in the way that company behaves they're, they're incredibly successful so you don't have to argue that but the the idea that um companies could could have designers as ceos is something that i think is is just w- would be fantastic because designers have so many skills yeah. they're, they're, and they, they look at things differently. They're creative, they're people focused, mm. um, all of those attributes and, and they can get the support in the areas they may not be so strong in like the commercial yeah. and the, and the finance side. Um, mm. But, you know, a company that's led by design um, I think about Allbirds, for example, and, you know, one of the founders is a designer and, you know, those types of companies are, are really mission driven mm. and purpose driven and they they succeed because they're delivering the public what they want yeah well i mean i feel like as well designers they kind of think more about the bottom line as well like they have more like knowledge mm. of the product side and the service side which is kind of the bottom line of a company whereas i feel like a lot of the time ceos they kind of get to that position from another company and don't even really know what like ha- actually happens on the bottom line of the business they kind of just only know the business side which is I feel yeah. like a bit of a pitfall. Yeah, I mean they can often they're driving it from a, a cost cutting yep. perspective as opposed to a business building perspective. Yep. I, I mean that's that's a very big generalization, yep. but that I, I think um, you know the way that we work is exactly like you're saying. We understand what goes into making a, a new watch or a, mm. um, a, a smartphone, and we know where you can make savings, and we can we know how it should be used mm. by the by the customer and what the customer is looking for so if you if you build it they will come sort of thing you know yes. it's it's that it's that sort of attitude so yeah i agree with what you're saying cool um uh, what types of clients do you typically work with and what and how do you approach designing for their needs yeah okay so um as a consultancy and particularly in the australian market we work for clients of all different um, types and and scales. So everything from um, everyday um, mums and dads who've come up with an idea based on their life experience, you know, you'd, you'd call them inventors or, mm. you know, start out entrepreneurs um, through to sort of serial entrepreneurs and then uh, local brands and manufacturers and then sort of global brands as well. So, you know, it, it it, it varies in scale from very small projects to very large projects and complexity as well. So, um, you know, we've recently designed a, uh, a tree guard. So if you think about um, when you see large plantations planted on the sides of roads and new, new developments and things, and they put those um, the green plastic yep. shrouds around the shrubs to keep them protected while they grow. Uh, we've had a, a local guy up here in in this region come to us and ask us to design a, a biodegradable solution that, that they can put out very quickly and install very quickly, um, but that will over a period of about two years biodegrade without any effect on the mm. effect on the environment. So that's an example of a of a very specific 
solution generated by someone in a trade mm. and it's a very small tight lean project and it's been a great project and we're, we're mm. super excited about it it's and good. then on the other hand we're working with the likes of Flightboard or um, Neutromics and doing you know large scale uh, consumer electronic products or medical products and you know we've got 10 to 15 people in our team working on these projects at times and mm. you know uh, multi-year uh, project uh, lifespans and 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 you, you grow with the client you know you mm. you start with small activities and then you grow and grow and you're doing all sorts of different activities from from industrial design and mechanical engineering through to branding and visualization and packaging and prototyping and all uh, you know production implementation so the the relationships are founded in the same philosophies and the same approach in terms of how we tackle our work and and what we think of our clients but the the amount of effort and the type of tasks change depending on the needs yeah um, so yeah it's it's i mean again harking back to what neil was saying it's very similar like you know i was i was listening to that podcast and just nodding my head the whole time because he's yeah it was a great he, podcast neil yeah i mean he's, he's fantastic um but the 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 interesting thing is his his experiences really mirror mine and 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 what we see at a, in our company is 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 a very similar thing and the you know the the client Oh, sorry. The Australian climate, in terms of, of of available clients, means that you have to be able to do all these different things. Mm. Um, whereas, whereas a you know a US client, for example, might only do front end industrial design and do the concepts, and then it's handed over to an engineering consultancy. You know, you come through our door and we do everything. Yep. So, yeah, mm. that's great. Um, can you share an example of a catapult? Well, actually, you kind of explained that, but a catapult project that you're very proud of that you've recently worked on. Maybe you could talk about. Um, oh, look, I, I, I'm proud of so many projects. The, the the team we have and and the way that they work as a, as a group and the the sort of support that they offer each other and the way that the projects. So in our in our um, company, the mm. the projects aren't specific to a particular office. So they they're, they're specific to particular people, and 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 we we grab the best person for the task for the particular project. So projects go between the offices and as a result, the the teamwork between the offices is fantastic. So um, that in itself makes me very proud of, of what we've developed over time and what the group is is working towards now. You know, it, it, whenever I talk about this stuff, it's it's so much about them and and, and the work that they do. And, mm. and certainly, um, you know, it just makes me incredibly proud to see what they're producing. Um, in terms of projects, I mean, we've talked about Flightboard, but uh, I guess it's it's a great example of the type of relationship we strive for. And we have um, a number of client relationships, probably 10 or 15 that are very similar to this, where we've, we've had multi-year relationships that have built from a small initial um, effort to to being embedded in in client teams and mm. you know you, you're part of the family with these whether it's designing um metal detectors for for mine lab or doing um you know uh, uh, onboard luggage scanning devices for for micro x and 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 really um breaking the mold and, and shifting the paradigm in terms of the way those products are working mm. or something like flightboard, which is a little bit more glamorous, but incredibly detailed and, and, and challenging. And, and from a very small beginning with just two or three of us working um, pretty hard, uh, completely dovetailed in with with uh, Flightboard's in-house team, which has got very significant. You know, they've grown from a, a founder operating out of his lounge room to um, more than a hundred staff globally, and mm. uh, you know, a, 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 a multi-million-dollar turnover. And it, it's just a it's just an exciting thing. So, from that perspective, I'm very proud of of that project and that relationship and the trust that they've given us and i guess we've earned in a way but the the way that that's evolved um across all spheres of of their product and how we support them and 
it's, it, you know, as they build up their internal team, we're still in there supporting them and, and, and they are um, supporting us. So it's a, it's a great relationship and, and extremely successful. So you see, I mean, there's an example of where you see the, um, the return on investment for design because um, uh, David Twern, who's the founder of Flightboard, um, has, you know, he's got a design background. He is a hero, a hero's design in terms of the process and, and, the, and the user experience. And, that goes through and trickles down through everything that they do. And it, and it helps us have a mandate to go in there and say, this isn't up to scratch or this needs to be better. So, um, yeah, it's... I think it's important know, that relationship as well, like having a client that's actually going to trust you as a, like your company as a design company, opposed to just being mm-hmm. like, no, that's wrong. It needs to be done this way. Like, I think that's really important now. Yeah, I, I think that's the thing. And, and um you know, you, you have to be prepared in our position, you have to be prepared to have some discussions that are robust at times. Mm. So there's always circumstances where we'll have a different opinion to the client and we'll push them hard. And okay, there are times when we have to step back because there's commercial constraints or there's time constraints or there's risk. Um, and, and And you've got to learn when to push and when not to push. Mm. But at the same time, it, one of our kind of um, key deliverables, I suppose, is to be provocative and to to push clients and to take them where they haven't been or where they didn't think they could go or they didn't know they could go. Um, it, it, you know, to this day, nothing excites me more than when our team presents concepts to a client for the first time and they just they're completely gobsmacked they just didn't think about the where the concept's gone they didn't imagine the solution and they see it and they just get so excited and that's probably some of the best reward you could get as a designer because you you know you see the guys that they've slaved over these things they put them in front of them with a prototype or a, a sketch and um the client's blown away and it's just it's just the best feeling. It's fantastic. That's great. How do you stay up to date with the latest trends and technologies in industrial design? For example, AI, VR, and automation. Yeah. Okay. So um, it's something we have to do mm. as cult consultants. We've got to be able to walk into any room, and even if you don't know anything about a topic, be, be able to ask the right questions to get up to speed really quickly. Mm. Um, we've got a lot of quite experienced staff, but we've got a lot of young staff as well. So you've got to be able to bring that through. We have um, internally at Catapult, we have a a thing called a champions uh, program. So everyone in the team has a particular area of interest that they're in charge of. Hmm. And so someone might be looking after materials, someone might be looking after technology, someone might be looking after um, rendering techniques or whatever. And their job is to keep up to date with the current status of whatever that topic is and Mm. feed information back to a central portal to the rest of the team Mm. so we we really we're like this big sort of um scanning machine that that looks for information and new ideas and then we share it back really really quickly and then you know often um sub teams are are sent to explore so obviously you know um ai and and mid journey and chat gpt are are very topical at the moment um we we had a team presentation by a little subgroup uh actually last week uh who's been out there investigating how we might utilize it in our in our um practices and whether if it's any value and and you know what are the pitfalls and and so on and so that's a great example where our guys are internally going out and finding information. Mm. Um, the the other way that it happens is we're, we're talking to clients who are operating in the cutting edge of technology all the time. So you walk into a, um, a meeting with a client who's doing a medical product and you've got to instantly find out information about science and understand biology or chemistry or, you know, mechanical forces. And then you might walk into a, a meeting the next day with a company that's it's purely brand based that's developing a range of watches and you've got to understand what the the fashion trends are uh, for next year and what materials and finishes people are looking for and who's their demographic and mm. all these things so it's I, I think 
really I would say it's about having curiosity and, and sort of embedding that in the way the company operates and the way that everyone thinks. So that it, it, it applies to everything, but that could be even how you do your daily operations or what software are we using? Or I, I saw in the news this particular topic and you've got to be curious to go and investigate it and say, is there anything relevant there? If there isn't, move on. If there is, you know, bring it back to the group and talk about it, present mm. it. And um, um, it's, I, 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 I like to say, um, you know, strongly pin, uh, strong opinions lightly held. So mm. by that, I mean that you, you feel forthright and you, and you feel, you feel like um, you, you have an opinion on things, but then, you've got to be prepared to change your mind or be shown a better way. And that's, that's a classic for industrial design because we have, we have opinions and we have ways of doing things, but you've got to be prepared to change all the time, mm -hmm. change, change. It's forever rolling on. So that's our challenge. Yeah. I'd say as a designer, as, as industrial design, generally people are fairly flexibly minded. Like they generally can kind of adopt new technologies and new practices pretty quickly. Yeah. I think that's kind of integrated into our like, design mind in a way i would agree mm. yeah i think i think it's a prerequisite and i think um people who end up being industrial designers are actually attracted to that yeah. and and like that and you know they've um you know in my case i was always playing with um my hand making making models and you know playing with lego and building okay. model cars and all of that sort of stuff and it graduated to other things and drawing and and so on and it, 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 it manifests in being a designer and, and I think people come to it in different ways, but nearly every industrial designer is inherently curious and, mm. and maybe less accepting of how the world is presented to them than mm. the average person. It's funny going a little bit off topic, but like yesterday I, I randomly decided to build a Lego car again after like, I don't know, like 15 <laughs> years, maybe more. And um, yeah. it's like, it's really amazing how I've developed my, my thinking around like something simple as Lego. Like back then I was like, yeah. oh, this is amazing. You can build all this. You can take it apart, build it that way. Now I'm looking at it. I'm like, wow, look at those injection molding marks. Like, yep. wow, how is that made? Yep. Like, I can't believe they made a mold for that kind of thing. Like it's, it's really yeah. interesting how I've like started to think about even something like Lego so differently. Yeah. yeah that's it's so true and i mean look they're they're at the uh, absolute elite level of yeah. mold molding and, and tooling but I, I, one of the things i find interesting is um as consultants you you'll you'll get a product brief for something that you've never thought about before um um i don't know you know say someone comes in and says i want to do a, a a shower for the my camper van mm -hmm. and and so all of a sudden Everywhere you go, you start seeing people in camper vans using showers. You know, it's or you know, we're we're, we're looking at some dog products, and you you start looking at at pets all of a sudden, and it it it's just an incredible thing that you 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 have a curiosity, you you you're able to notice these things in the mm -hmm. world, and um, normal people just walk past and don't see it. So yeah, I. Um, I agree totally, and uh, I love I love the fact that you can pick up something and start going. Well, how is this made? And, yeah. and um, you know, what a great job they've done, or what a terrible job they've done. Why do they tool it that way? Or why is that part line there? Yeah. Or, My girlfriend you know. always picks on me because I'm always so critical of like things. Yeah. Like, that. like we went to Tasmania, and there was these really nice looking like architectural buildings, and I was like up there. I was like, look at this, look at this gap between the building. Like it's not even here and here. Like, yeah. And she's like, why well, the building looks great. And I was like, yeah, but it's badly lined up. <laughs> yeah, because all you can see is that mismatch yeah. of the gap. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. <laughs> um, how do you see these emerging technologies as far as the technologies that we mentioned before reshaping industrial design in the future? Uh, yeah, look, it's hard to say at the moment. I mean, um, I feel like um, AI... I, AI and VR and so on have got a long way to go and, and everyone's familiar with the flaws of, of what's happening. They're certainly interesting and we certainly need to be playing with it, but um, the ability for uh, an experienced designer to solve a problem and challenge an idea and, and move in a different direction because of a sense of what might work and might not is, is still unchallenged, I mm -hmm. think. Um, I mean, anecdotally, I can tell you a, a, a really cool little VR story. Um, we, so we, 
a um, few years ago did a whole heap of work for a company called Boom Supersonic. So they're doing developing a supersonic um, passenger airliner uh, in Denver, Colorado. And um, we were involved right from the beginning to help develop concepts for their interior as part of their, their sort of building their company presence and understanding what was involved in, in the aircraft and also trying to um, get PR out there to 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 uh, get funding, I guess, to get investment. And we uh, one of the um, one of the things we did because an aircraft is so large is we we actually built a three D model of the aircraft interior, and then we we got it put into a, a VR model. And when they did the sort of initial launch of the concept and and um, announced Virgin Galactic involved their involvement and everything we we went over to to colorado and um were involved in a sort of presentation and part of that was was setting up the vr um headsets and allowing people at this event to put them on and we at the event we met some original concord pilots so mm -hmm. these guys probably in their in their 70s or so now really old famous pilots lovely lovely smart um mm -hmm gentlemen and one of them said to us look I, i'd really like to have a go of these vr headsets and so um myself and our our chief uh, design officer troy nice and um took this gentleman over and put the headset on him and he starts walking around in this virtual aircraft and we could see what he was seeing and everything and he was he was gobsmacked like he he just loved it absolutely loved it but he he he, he said to us oh the floor's not sloped and we said, what? And he goes, oh, the Concorde used to fly on an incline of seven degrees. Hmm. That's the way that that's the way the aerodynamics worked. Yeah. And so all of the trolleys and everything in the aircraft were sloped forward seven degrees. So they sat vertical. And he said, does this plane fly on an incline? And we sort of looked at each other and went, we actually don't know. And we called over the head of engineering who's, you know, just some amazing rocket scientist ex nasa sort of guy and he's just incredible and we said um is this aircraft going to fly on an incline and they and he said oh yeah, yeah probably about three degrees and <laughs> nobody had told us and we're like okay well that's a great finding from yeah. the from well, that's what it all happened like, because of the vr environment like, even just yeah. as like years of experience research vr can be so amazing yeah mm -hmm. yeah so that's anecdotally look i think um my, my hope for this particular question is that things like sustainable solutions so materials processes the idea of of changing to a circular economy is where i see the most interest, interesting change happening in the next 10 to 15 years so mm. it's being sort of forced upon us and and some in in society are not as convinced as others but i guess from our point of view we're really thinking about that as a priority mm. And we're, we're really interested in, in where that can go. And you, you see the success, the success of, of companies like Allbirds or Patagonia and, and, and those types. Nike, Nike's doing some incredible stuff. Even Apple is changing the way they operate now and the right to repair and, and so on. All of these things are gaining momentum. And mm -hmm. so I, I actually see that technology and the ability to actually impact Mm. what we do and how we do it as, as the most important thing for industrial yeah. design in the next 10 years. I think it's really interesting. Like we've spoke about this in the podcast before, but moving back towards more of like a, a past design um, philosophy yes. opposed to what we had before, like example, like I, I'm really into like vintage film cameras. Yep. So, like, this is yep. like a 1980s um, USSR film camera. Yes. Um, yes. and like this thing is tank. like it's like it's like 90 percent metal like everything is metal this is just this is not even for the camera but everything else is yeah. pretty much metal yes. and like this thing is just like a tank like it'll it's it's what like 70 years old and it will probably no mm. not 70 this one's younger actually 50 years old and like it'll probably go another mm. 50 years easily you know yeah. and like but things just aren't built like that anymore like there isn't that emphasis on durability and you know long lifespan I think it's starting to change though. And I think, you know, we're seeing more and more brands that are that are doing sort of more bespoke solutions that are higher quality, uh, a little bit more handmade, mm. lower volume, higher cost. Um, I, I, the, the, the challenge will be that 
there's always going to be this huge consumer market that, mm. that is happy to that wants to pay the lowest price, mm. and that's probably an an Australian um, uh, sort of characteristic as well. We want to go to Bunnings and pay eight dollars for a power drill, and yeah. if you're paying eight dollars for it, it means it was made for eighty cents. Like if people knew that, like if they think about that, yeah, that, that that's obscene. Like it's obscene. Mm. So what cut uh, what. What like corners had to be cut to get it to that price? That's the thing. Exactly, exactly. And and how long is that product going to last? And you get it home, and it'll it'll run for, you know, two or three uses, and then blow up, and you'll throw it away, and you'll go and buy another one. And and, it, and that that mentality has to change. And the, and the whole idea that you can you can repair something, you can have a camera that lasts for 50, 75 years is is unreal. And I and I think that's where we need to to refocus as a design community yeah um and again it's going to take some convincing Mm. for our clients but some clients are really engaged in it and Mm. that's a priority for them others aren't so pick and choose i guess yeah i mean i suppose it's going to get to the point where like government's legislating this kind of thing more and more it'll come to the point where it will big big organizations won't have a choice whether they follow it or not which isn't necessarily yeah. I don't really like the idea of like legislating to forcing organizations. I feel like organizations should just want to do that, but this is the world we live in. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. But I think if you don't legislate, there'll always be people that cut corners. And yeah. and so you have to do some legislation. Mm. I think ultimately what'll make it succeed is consumers driving it. And we're already seeing that with, you know, online feedback and forums and things where consumers have a real say in how brands evolve now. And as a brand, if you're presenting a brand to your customer base, you have to be on point. You have to be authentic in the way that you do things or they'll rip you apart. And so um, I I think that self-determination and the ability to um, meet your customer needs might be the other thing that drives this because people are demanding more. They're sick of floods. They're sick of bushfires. They're sick of going to Indonesia and jumping in the water and seeing a foot of rubbish on top of the surf and stuff like that. So um, I I think that sort of stuff will will drive it as well. Yeah. Um, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I spoke to David Shaw. Are you familiar with him? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So David was saying how basically like the way he does it is he talks to his clients and he's like, well, my bench, my park bench is going to last for like 15 years. I have like benches that are still sitting there. I can show you. Whereas mm. like it may cost a higher price, but it's got that like durability. Whereas like if you have buy this one, it's going to last like a couple of years at the best. So I suppose I that's kind of the, the argument you have to give them and be like, you can make the decision. Do you want to pay the higher price um, for a good, for a good bench or do you want to pay, you know, that's kind well, of, the, yeah. I think I think that's part of it. I also think as designers that we should almost demand that sort of thought process. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the amazing thing he does is is both a um, a mechanical approach. So physically, his products survive that long mm-hmm. outdoors, which is just you know a sign that, that he, they're well designed yeah. and well manufactured. Yeah. But also hit the way that he styles them is is this sort of clean, contemporary, um, classic sort of style which means that they'll last a long time and they're not um slaves to fashion mm, yeah. so that's the other thing is you, you know you you've got to be that that's where the form and the aesthetic comes in, in in my opinion is is pairing back a product to its essential elements and and being really considered about what you're delivering and not just putting i, I hate putting parts on products that are only there for a decorative purpose. Yeah. Like they should always have multiple purposes. They should always be delivering some sort of function or some sort of. Function. It's the oldest yeah. one in the book. It, it's the best one. It's yeah. the best one too. Mm. Yeah. What advice would you give to a young designer such as myself um, who is looking to break into the <laughs> industrial design career? Yeah, well, this is really topical because uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but we've we've actually just run a. a competition called launch which we're we're hoping to turn into a yearly uh competition for graduates and so we I, i've spent the last two or three months as have our leadership team speaking to probably f- nearly 50 um new applicants mm. for that role and it was was actually really really good for me personally because i was a little bit disillusioned with 
some of the applicants I'd come across in recent times and the mm. people that applied across the board were fantastic. And mm. the level, the quality of the work was fantastic. The quality of the people was mm. just really impressive. We could have picked 10 or 15 out of the 50 that got through um, that, that would have walked straight into our team. So I was, I was just really impressed with it. Um, I guess if I'm talking about being in that position and trying to get a get a role in a consultancy or as a designer, um, it's it's challenging. Um, I said before that, that the Australian market is quite small. There's only a certain amount of roles in design consultancies full stop, and then there's an even smaller percentage that are available to you know, recent grads and junior designers. So you've got to you've got to work really hard at it. You've got to be really persistent. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you've also got to be very considered and, and and polite in the way that you behave. So don't don't walk in off the street and just knock on the door and expect to be able to talk to senior people in a design consultancy. You've got to make you know reach out to them, get a relationship, make an appointment, and most people will see you um, at, at at some time. What I've said to a lot of designers who perhaps need to work on their skills is go and work in-house somewhere first. If you want to be in a consultancy, there's very few people that come out of a um, university degree and can walk straight into a consultancy simply because of the 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 demand. If we advertise, we've got 50 applicants, you know, and, and um, if we advertised a, a, a sort of junior to mid-level position, we'd probably get 150 mm-hmm. applicants from all over the world. So the the... The thing is, you have got to continually work on yourself as a designer. I'm speaking from personal experience. I spent four years working for a lighting company, Mm. and it it wasn't what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. But A, it got me some money, but more importantly, it got me experience in dealing with people in in um, office politics, in manufacturing challenges. The company I worked for had a factory, so I was always in the factory getting abused by, you know, operators because I was some young designer who didn't know what I was talking about. And you learn very quickly what to do and what not to do. Mm. And that, and while I was doing that, I still kept in contact with people that I'd I'd met in design consultancies. And and eventually a job came up at Outer Space Design and I got it. And I had I had something in my folio that, that was interesting to them. So mm. they could put me to work when I joined them. So mm. I think for me, that's the the primary thing. Uh, the The interesting thing for young designers now is that there's a lot broader range of um, uh, sub careers that you can get into, whether it's digital or um, you know packaging or branding or industrial design as a core practice. And even in industrial design, there's you know some people are, are front end designers, some people are, are technical, some people are sort of all rounders, you, mm-hmm. you know, people are people are interested in CAD. So I, I just think um, don't expect to say that you can do any everything. Mm. Celebrate what you're good at, and admit what you need work on, and work on those things if you want to get better at them. If you don't, yeah. and you want to focus on a particular niche, that's fine as well. Um, there's opportunities in that mm. approach. Do you think as a graduate, it's good to go? Like I know a lot of my friends are. Kind of like contemplating going down a, a similar path and then moving back into industrial design like for example ux is very mm. um easy to well, not easy to get a job in, but there's more jobs in ux right now would you um, recommend like moving into a different discipline and then kind of coming back into industrial design or do you think it's hard to get back in once you're out kind of thing? um my, my gut feel is it'd be hard to get back in once you're out um but it depends how deeply you dive in and it depends if you if you love that area then mm by all means, go for it. Um, I know a young designer who's, who's actually lives up here and he's he's an industrial designer and quite a capable one and he's gone into a digital um, sort of stream and he's doing really well and I think he's enjoying it. Mm. Um, so th- that can work for sure. And that's the beauty of industrial design is that it, it's a many-headed beast. You know, you can go anywhere you like. Um, I think if you're, if you're attracted to designing um lots of different things and and um working in different ways and you know um having daily challenges that are that are varied then 
um, sticking to a, a a path that takes you towards a consultancy is a really good one. Mm. Um, it, it's really a, a personal taste. And, and, and the other thing I'd say is that, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to travel with design as well. So, you know, I, we certainly see a lot of applicants coming from overseas, coming to Australia, trying to get work because it's a great place to live. Mm. Um, We've got an intern at the moment from Belgium, and she's fantastic. And she's she's come across the world to to live here and work here, and she's she's enjoying life, and she's doing a great job. And she's, mm. um, you know, we're, we're we're super pleased to have her as part of our team. So that works both ways. We like having people from different backgrounds and having diversity within our team, and uh, so that can help young designers. Um, if they go overseas and get experience in certain areas and come back, you know, that can be interesting to us as well. Very cool. Uh, what skills do you see as, as essential for success in this industry? And what are some common areas where designers struggle? Yeah, okay. So, um, look, I've mentioned it already, but I think curiosity um, and communication are, are probably the two biggest high-level skills that you need. So, um I think you've got to be able to accept that you're the dumbest person in the room and go into a meeting with people and ask them questions and find out about a topic. Mm. Okay. So, I mean, I, I see our guys go into meetings with clients and they are so good at, at asking, you know, incisive questions and interesting questions and getting people talking and mm. discovering stuff that the, the client doesn't realize. So that skill Mm. is essential and we really work on that we really work on you know looking at a, a conversation or a task or a problem and saying how you know let's tip it on its head why is it why are they wanting to do that how how, how could we do it better mm. so that that's that's key things um I, I guess in terms of skill sets everyone has their strengths and weaknesses and mm. i think you've got to accept that and I, I mean again talking personally because i can relate to it but everyone loves the idea of, of sketching and being an amazing concept designer you know everyone sort of strives for that but but there's only a few percentage of people that can really do it at a level that is is a sort of presentable level but everyone can sketch little concepts and little ideas to explain them and so mm. i i feel like the, the simple task of sketching and being able to um, it's almost like playing Pictionary, right? Mm. If you can sketch an idea and talk about it and show it with a few simple lines, you, you get so much further than if you can't. And mm. you might be an engineer and you, you should be able to sit in a room and sketch an idea or nut out a principle and, and, and joust with a designer mm. on the topic and, and, sort of leapfrog each other to get to the solution. So we are big proponents of sketching, and that's probably one of the things that I see the least of in a lot of folios. Everyone's, and it's cliched, but everyone's really keen to jump into CAD, um, do a beautiful render, and there's not much essence to it if you if you pull it apart. And and I think that's probably the primary problem with AI right now is, mm. you know, you you do a mid-journey concept, which on the face of it might look pretty cool, but does it consider anything about how it's made or um, how it's used or why is the zipper on the backpack there instead of here and and so on? So mm. I, I think those, the critical thinking is the thing and, and the, the, the robust critique, you know, that, that ability to, to both ask questions and have questions asked of you mm. and, and be able to put your work up and accept that your work's not going to be the best. Mm. It's not perfect, but as a group, there's nothing personal in a critique. It's really about getting the best result for the client. And mm. so we, we try and really create an environment that's very supportive, but also very demanding. Mm. And, and, you know, we don't want, crappy ideas that can't be made mm. that's not part of the that's not part of the brief you've got to actually come up with ideas that that have a path that can be done mm. even if we don't know how to do it right now it's possible we think we think we can work towards it in some mm. way and have a strategy towards that so that mm. you know that then that brings in i guess materials and processes and i mean i i find that a lot of young graduates um 
know a little bit about materials and processes. You know, they, they've got a sort of general knowledge, mm. but probably the um, the blind spot is that simply because there's hardly any manufacturing in Australia now, they haven't been into an injection molding factory. Mm. They haven't been into a CNC machining uh, workshop. They, mm. they don't know what anodizing actually means when you say, I want a product anodized. They don't know actually how that happens and what mm. the, the, the caustic chemicals do. Mm. So, uh, you know, there's those things that are difficult. And I, I guess we overcome that with visits to China or, or Asia to look at factories and things. And that's really critical probably, as well. But that'll come with experience. Yeah. You'll probably remember that from um, Neil Davis's podcast. He mentioned that he used to go and just, you know, yeah. Rock off at um, manufacturers. I, from that, I took some knowledge and I actually started doing that. And I like, I think like the knowledge yeah. I got from like, you can watch LinkedIn learning courses on like, you know, CNC manufacturing injection molding, but actually being there and like looking at how the machines do what they do is so much more um, enjoyable. And like, you just get so much more out of it. Well, I, I, do, it, I do personally. So it, it's amazing. And to understand what's going on. I mean, we, as part of our, our champions program, we actually take our staff out mm-hmm. to, manufacturing facilities and we show them around and we because um particularly some of the senior team have got really strong lifetime relationships with manufacturers yes. so we can um you know they're very generous if we bring them up um you know we 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 have done things like run up box and dice who are in sydney they're a, a prototyping um, company with a long history which we've worked with over the years and we we ring up those guys and we we say, can we bring our team over to have a look? And they're just that they they welcome you with open arms. They'll set up a bench for people to work on if they mm-hmm. want to. You know that these these companies are they're, they're so keen to collaborate, and I think that's probably a really changing um, aspect of our our profession is that people are much more open to collaboration mm-hmm. these days. Well, they're also just passionate about what they do. I feel like with manufacturers, yep. they want to share their knowledge with others. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I met this um guy who's injection molder up in North Brisbane and he was just the nicest guy like he just was like, so he's like I've been doing this for 30 years and he's like for even longer for 40 years and he's like telling me about how like all these different processes and you can just tell he's so passionate about it and it's yeah. like it's, they're, they're honestly the easiest people to talk to a lot of the time manufacturers yeah in- and you you learn so much um you know you, it'll stick with you for a lifetime and you, you only have to see it to understand you know what what actually happens when a tool opens and a part's ejected and mm. you know when things go wrong or what, it, what what's it look like when someone's actually spinning a, a piece of metal into a lampshade you know you, mm. when you see that stuff it's it's quite phenomenal and impressive mm. and then you can look at it and go oh i could actually use that when I'm working on this other product that's in a completely different industry, but I can yeah. bring that technology across. Mm. So yeah, I think it's really important. Mm. Uh, how important is collaboration and teamwork in your design process? And how do you foster a strong culture of collaboration within the team of Catapult? Yeah, it's, it's the number one thing. So um, we, it, it's fortunately become a culture in the company and it's something that we, um, we set out to do uh, my my background a long time ago has always been sort of playing team sports and I, I personally I, I feel like the team is so much more powerful than the individual and every team has its stars there's no doubt about mm-hmm. that and um, we certainly have people who are as individuals are incredibly powerful but as a team they're unstoppable mm-hmm. and so we <sighs> I, I I don't know if demand's the right word. It's 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 an expectation that everyone collaborates, and mm. and that is that is exaggerated by the fact that we are in separate offices and we're distributed a little bit. Um, we actually work really hard to um, to push that, mm. um, even to the point of using tools. Um, so in in the last few years, we've really started using Miro a lot, which most of your listeners would be familiar with, and using that as a collaborative tool. So it's a project-based tool. We we use it as if we had a pin board in our studio and we're putting our work up on, on the pin board, but it, it, everyone can see it. And in, in many cases, the clients can see it and have input. And, and so there's an idea that that allows us to see see a project unfold and, and see the ideas and also have a record of that. Um, 
I think the other thing, and I mentioned it before, but the idea of a critique and the ability to um, sit down with your colleagues and actually challenge a solution and say, do you think this is the best? Um, uh, you know, we've got, I've got a designer, um, Michael Rosignola, who works in our, in our Byron studio, and he's an extremely experienced designer who's been at it for many years. And yet he'll still do a leg of work and then bring it to the group and say, what do you think about this? How do you think I'm I'm doing this? Do you think this is okay? Mm. And he's he's not doing that because he um, he doubts his ability. He's doing that to try and get the best possible yep. result. And it's just indicative of the way that we try and work. I mean, it's, you have to we're not perfect, and actually just know when to accept criticism and ask for criticism as well. So, yeah, yeah, and it's 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 criticism. Not in a in a in a personal way or a, um, a, a, an aggressive way or anything like that. It's more about critiquing and and asking the questions. Is this is this achieving the design brief? Is this doing what the client wants? And it's understanding what's driving the client hmm. too. So the client might be driven by cost of goods, or they might be delivered by a fear that their competitor has got more features than them, hmm. or you know they might be delivered by the uh, uh, driven by the time that they have to get to market. And so you've got to understand those things and you say, well, when we present these concepts, this one's going to cost less, um, but it's not going to achieve the features that you want. This one's going to cost more, but it's going to take longer, um, mm. but it'll deliver all the features. You know, which one do you want to do? Which mm. way do you want to go? And and so it's it's about doing that sort of effort and getting that understanding. Um, just Last thing on collaboration, which we're finding is really evolving since COVID, hmm. is we're doing a lot of collaboration which with companies that would be seen as our competitors. Hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of respect and value in jumping into bed with competitors and tackling a project that you mightn't have got by yourself. Hmm. But because you're collaborating and, and you're bringing double the resources or different skill sets together that sort of have a Venn diagram of crossover, mm. you, you're actually getting a much better outcome. And, and and I think that's something that's changed from when I first started as a designer and you wouldn't let anyone from another design mm. consultancy in the front door. Um, it, there's a there's a, a lot more openness now and, and a mm. willingness to, to share. I think as designers that needs to change, like, I mean, I suppose it goes back to like the old thing uh, where you don't show your portfolio around because it's like this yeah. message. Like it's where yeah. we're all on like a unique mission, I suppose. And that's like, if we all come together in that mission, we'll do better, especially in Australia because we're such a small market. Like if we want to really build up as a global market, like this is kind of part of the reason why I started the podcast is like to try and foster more of community in design. So I mm. think like if you, like right now we're kind of separated, we have some community, but not to the level of other um, discipline no. and no. like if we foster more of a community it'll be a lot better for the progression of australian design oh, i agree and i and i think even to the point where historically you know the capital cities design teams didn't really mix at all but now it's now it's starting to happen and yeah uh, i i think there's just more of a freedom and the fact that people are working remotely and and that that people have accepted um a, a more global economy Mm. these things open up automatically and mm. I, I just i'm a big believer in relationships and one of the things that we really strive hard for as a company is to build relationships whether that's with our clients our staff our our suppliers you know we had a circumstance yesterday where we had a um a sort of mini production run quoted by a manufacturer that we use mm. all the time, all the time. Mm. And we we put it to the client and it was too high. Mm. And we went back to the manufacturer and said, is this the best you can do? And and they cut it down. They said, what target do you want? We'll meet it. Mm. That was, and that was purely based on the relationship we have with that company and yeah. the fact that we we do a lot of work with them. And, and yeah. that is so rewarding to be able to go back to the client and say, hey, we've pulled some strings for you. This supplier is going to do it because of the relationship. There you mm. go. That you get you benefit. Um, mm. it, it that happens all the time in 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 areas, and whether it's a uh, asking a favour or you know ringing up a subcontractor and saying, "Hey, I need some help here um, on this particular aspect of a project." Mm. 
you know, we're, we're struggling with this mechanism or we, we can't do this testing because we don't have this machine. Can you help us? And they go, yep. And away we go. I so. suppose that's the competitive advantage of a like larger consultancy like like Catapult. Is it like they actually have that those relationships like, you know, fostered yeah. through like previous years of work, whereas opposed like smaller consultancies, even though they may have a, have a smaller, um, you know, final cost, they might not have that that capability. It's definitely an advantage and um, that extends to not just the networks, but also the experience of the team. So, yeah. um, you know, if we have a project come in with a particular problem, all we have to do is ask the team and there's bound to be someone who's tackled something similar mm-hmm. before. Um, the, the the senior members of our team are just um, so capable and so experienced that there's hardly anything that they haven't it you know, touched on at some point in mm. their career, one of them or, or another. So yeah. it's fantastic in that regard. It's like a, it's like a um, inbuilt library, you know. Mm. That's great. Uh, what, what do you, what we, this is kind of the same thing as well, but what did you, what do you think sets Catapult apart from other consultancies? Like we've already mentioned the, um the knowledge, but anything else you can think of that really sets you apart and the strengths in the, as far as strengths um, and capabilities? Look, when we started Catapult, our our goal was to create a company that was to great to work for and and facilitated um, a great environment, but produced global standard work. We really, even when we were one or two or three or six people, we wanted to produce work that could be held up against the IDOs and the fuse projects and the frog designs of this world. And and we benchmark ourselves against them. Mm. So we want to be on that playing field. Um, I guess the core way that we've done that is through building relationships and emphasizing communication. So um, I think if you pick the right people, the skills take care of themselves and the design work, you know, if you've got the right culture and the right environment, the design work is a is an outcome. Mm. But what what the essence of the company is, is is building relationships with our clients. We have so many clients that we've been with for years and we will do everything we can to avoid um, burning a client or or, or blowing up a relationship because of things that haven't gone right and and look it, it's in it's design right occasionally projects go badly yeah. um that's a fact of life and everyone talks about how great everyone's work is but occasionally you stuff up or you you, you don't hit the mark or for various circumstances projects are just a struggle and you've got to own that and you've mm-hmm. got to you've got to actually work to improve but at the essence of it it's still about the relationships. And so that's probably the key difference. We really work hard to be part of our clients' ecosystems mm-hmm. and to be, if they have a problem, we're the one that they call. If they want to design something else that we weren't working on, we're the one that they call. If, you know, we, great story with with someone like um, MindLab who we work with in, in South Australia. We We've done... Over the journey, we've probably done eight, 10 different products for them over the last 10 years. And we started out initially only doing industrial design and styling and, and a little bit of UX sort of stuff with them. And the most recent project we did for them, we were managing the whole project. We were managing external suppliers. We were managing their internal domains. You know, we were instrumental in the way the project flowed through their system. Mm. And so... For us, we look at that as a, a um, you know, a sign that the relationship is maturing, and we're doing the right thing. They're doing the right thing, and and the outcomes are, are fantastic because we know their product so well. And that sort of happens in every project, hopefully. Mm, that's great. Uh, how do you balance the need of the needs of your clients with your own creative vision? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think if you if you do the job well you bring them on the journey, Mm. right? So, um, and and it's easy. When it's hard is when you're not on the journey together. And um, that can be difficult if you've got a client that's really engineering focused or cost driven and you want to do something a bit more 
out there a bit more risky or a bit more expensive because it mm. it's going to look fantastic and it's going to you know set a brand precedent you've got to bring them you've got to tell them the story and tell them why and nine times out of ten if you tell them why they'll either say yes i agree with you let's go or they'll come back and they'll say you're right but the cost of goods is the most important thing. And we need to hit that foot first and foremost. Let's take some of these things out to make sure we hit the cost of goods and we'll succeed. And then we'll see what happens in the future and we might be able to do another model. So most of the time, clients don't just outright reject. Um, but if you, it, it all depends on how you communicate it and, mm. and how you approach it. Uh, I, I think a lot of design is about telling a story, even if you're presenting a concept presentation. So talking to students out there, don't just put like random sketches up or random renders or something. Tell a story. What, you know, what's the problem? Why, why, why have you identified as things that you need to fix? And then what does your concept do to solve those problems? Why would, why would a consumer want to use it? Mm. And that, that just gives it, that much more of a compelling um, story that people then come with you. And it's not a, it's not a fight. You're not dragging them by their collar mm. through, through the process. I suppose this comes back to communicating the value design as well. Yes. Mm. Oh, it's all tied in. You yeah. know, it's, it's, it's communicating the value of design and also um, understanding that you need to have a certain amount of expertise when you enter these conversations and if you don't you need to say so so if you don't know something you don't say oh i know blah 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 blah. you got you got to you got to actually say oh i don't know that i'll go and find out and we'll come back to you uh -huh. that's interesting that's kind of why i created the podcast like i was like i, I don't have the any expertise myself but if i can get all these people on and they're willing to come on who have way more experience than me i can learn from them and it's like going to benefit me and also benefit my listeners so yeah yeah but, I, I agree. Yeah, it's great. Uh, how do you measure success of a design project? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. And, it, uh, you know, going right back to what we talked about at the start, it's um, it's sometimes difficult to measure success. Mm. Um, there's the, the obvious metrics is did you get the work done and on time and on budget, um, mm. which is, you know, the, the sort of the grey cloud that looms over all consultancies and in, in how they work and you, you're on the treadmill the whole time. So you're running fast to get stuff done and you're meeting deadlines and so on. But I, I think success comes down to seeing what happens with the client and how they, when they launch their, their products and their satisfaction and their, their customer satisfaction. And ultimately um, particularly if they're more than a, a one trick pony, if they come back to you for future work, you could probably bet that your, your previous product work was a success. Mm. So um, it, it's, it's tricky. I mean, if I use Flightboard as an example, seeing um, a, a founder build a business around himself that was zero non-existent five years ago and now employs 110 people and um, numerous other sub businesses servicing their needs it it's an astonishing thing to think about and and governments should be just falling over themselves to encourage these types of companies to grow because they just they they generate work they ge generate careers they generate um interest in 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 technology it's just a an amazing thing so mm. for for me that's that's part of the motivation and the, and the identification of success. I see, I see um, great potential in Australia. Like I think we could be the next kind of America, like how, like maybe not in the current sense, but like the original America <laughs> where there was like, you yeah. know, there's these big founding companies like Apple and, you know, all these companies that have paved the way, even in, even like from an architectural perspective, like paved the way kind of for like business development and like bringing businesses to the global scale. Like, I feel like we definitely could, we could bring that, but I think design will be a big key part of it if we um, adopt it more into our operation. Yeah, mm. uh, I think that's a great insight. We, it, it's happening. So mm. we're we're getting companies, whether it's a you know med tech companies, the the cochleas and the um, the resmeds of this world, or you know um, high tech electronics. You look at Black Magic Design, who's doing camera equipment and 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 really are the global leaders in that sort of 
niche and and that is completely founded on an amazing design team and a technical team and you know you look at the work that they do and the, the pride and the consistency and the um the innovation that they put out that's just a great example of a, a company that's completely commercially based around hitting those design markers and for me, that they're inspirational. You, you know, you think of someone like Rode Microphones who uh, are, are doing the same thing in audio and they're, they're leading the world. It, it can all happen from Australia, so there's no reason why we can't do it. We just have to be motivated and and perhaps a little bit more nimble than some of the big behemoths yeah. that overseas. If anything, we have an advantage to some degree as we're like a smaller market, so we have more ability to move in and out of niches opposed to more fixed... Yep businesses yeah yeah i think so and i think also we have um you know just a a cultural personality to to get into technical stuff and and develop niches very quickly mm. um a little bit like the kiwis you know we we, we tend to do that sort of stuff because of our isolation mm. um i was talking to someone the other day about um the the brand arrival who are doing electric vehicles in the mm. uk yeah. and um they're doing incredible work. Like as a designer, you look at that and go, oh my God, it's amazing. Mm. But, you know, they're, they're really struggling commercially because they're so bloated. They're so they're so big that they have to have huge amounts of sales to succeed. Mm. Whereas, you, you know, you're looking at, you look at a little company like that's based out of Melbourne, like Jaunt, who, who are doing, um, you know, Land Rover, electric vehicle trans, uh, um, renovations or whatever. Yeah, uh, conversions. And they're, they're, they're doing this like little bespoke thing at a really, really high level mm. and they're succeeding because people are interested in it. And I think that's that's where Australia probably sits. You know, we're not going to compete with China and yeah. there's no way we'll catch up there, but we can we can compete on those, those niche mm. um, bespoke sort of solutions. How do you see Catapult in the next five to 10 years? And what, like, what, what, evolution do you see in the organization where would you like it to go where, where wouldn't you like it to go maybe yeah um look our our sort of bold ambition is to be um a, a global design leader so mm. you know that's what we're, we're building a team to take us there um i I don't necessarily think we're seeking growth for growth's sake but we we really are trying to to be, um, you know, at a level with the other larger design consultancies in the country, and certainly um, be able to walk into a conversation with a Fuse project or an IDO or a Frog and and hold our own. So mm-hmm. that's that's our hope. I think we're also looking pretty creatively at at what our business relationships might be. So um, building out joint ventures, building out opportunities to develop products very specifically with partners Mm. or by ourselves um, in a way that evens out the consulting roller coaster Mm. (laughs) that is that can be pretty stressful so we're looking at 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 things like that um, you know whether it's taking part equity in certain projects or putting royalties or putting together joint ventures with like-minded groups we've done all of those things in in recent times and we've set up the company to be able to do that so um look watch this space it should be pretty exciting uh i i also think that you know we've gone through a really serious growth period and we've we've done a lot of work over the last three years to empower our team Mm. so um for me personally that means stepping back from from being the face of the company and actually pushing forward the group because they're the ones that are doing the work. They're the ones that have got all the talent and, you know, they need to represent the company and the company brand. That's that it's about them um, mm. and, and and not about me personally. So that I'm, you know, I'm on a personal journey to sort of step, step back from that and be less of a spokesperson for the company and, mm. and just um, allow those people to grow up. And I, I think, that's one of the things I certainly struck in my career is that there's times where you you reach a glass ceiling in certain organisations and um, I know why that happens. Everyone understands it, but 
we're trying to create a structure that allows the company to be ongoing and mm. and and continue to evolve. Um, and and that that has to happen, otherwise you become a design, a dinosaur very quickly. So yeah, um, yeah. yeah that's great. Uh, what advice would you give to young entrepreneurs um, looking to start their own design consultancy or even a more creative style business? Yeah. Um, look, the advice I would say is if, if you feel strongly about something, have a go at it and, and back yourself. Um, I would also preface that with a comment to say that be aware of what you don't know. Um, so, you, you know, there's a lot of, in, in young designers, there is a degree of naivety combined with enthusiasm, which is fantastic. But if you're running a business and you have got a lot to learn, you can sometimes shoot yourself in the foot. So there is an aspect of going out and learning and speaking to people and, and doing what you're doing, which is an incredible way to to understand and learn about um design and the design careers from other people. I think that's important. Most young designers, if 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 they reached out to me, for example, they reached out to Neil or they reached out to uh, Fred Blocklinger or um, you know, Murray Hunter or people around the place, people will take their calls, people will speak to them and and give them encouragement and mm-hmm. give them a bit of time. So I would encourage people to do that and mm-hmm. and stay in touch and network and learn from other designers um you know we still learn things every day we're learning new things every day and and so um if you're going to start your own business that it it is just this relentless um roller coaster that you get on that you have to learn not just about being a designer that's that's only a small fraction of the the effort you've got to learn you know tax laws hr uh, laws you've got to learn how to manage people you've got to learn how to manage time and budgets and clients and how do you get work in how do you get that work through your company Mm. how do you get outcomes that are worthwhile you know there's there's so much Mm. that's exciting it's really exciting but it's also um it's stuff that nobody can really help you with until you get into it yourself Mm. and you and you learn these things Mm. Well, thank you for coming on today, Nathan. I think we've had a very interesting chat. And yeah, I think you've got a lot of insights that a lot of people are really interested to listen to. And I hope it, I hope it helps them out, If whether you're in my position or whether you're in a career where you're looking for a change, looking to maybe even start your own consultancy after having experience, you know, talk to Nathan. Nathan, I'm sure you'd be happy to take that call. Yes, I will, Roman. That's Thanks very much for the opportunity. They're so, they're so friendly. Like they just, I, I feel like if you spoke to some business person higher up, they would not want to take your call, whereas designers are always happy to help the other person out get to where they are. And it's, yeah, it's really good to see. Well, it comes back to that community thing, right? So, um, yes, we're competitive. Yes, we want to succeed, but we don't want to succeed at the expense of others. Mm. We want to push design up. Like every designer you meet is an advocate for design yeah. and the design community. So it, it, that's a strong thing that we need to keep going. Mm. Well, yeah, thank you, Nathan.